Screaming at your TV screen is no alien concept to a horror fan. We scream at the scary, we scream at the delightfully good, and we scream at the horrifically bad. But every now and then, a horror movie comes along that makes you want to scream for all the wrong reasons. Character deaths are a staple of the horror genre, but they don't always provide the emotional punch intended. Most of the time, you're left with a feeling of anti-climax or just pure bitterness, as you find yourself asking the question, did they really need to die? From stupid decisions, on the character's part to just downright lazy plot writing. I'm Amy from What Culture Horror, and these are 10 horror movie deaths that could have been avoided. Number 10, Phil, Hutch, and Dom, The Ritual. This 2017 low budget folk horror sees best friends Phil, Hutch, Dom, and Luke all take a hike through the Swedish mountains to honor their late friend, Rob. However, shortly after the beginning of the hike, Dom sprains his ankle, making him unable to complete the hike properly. Hutch suggests that the group take a shortcut through the ominous Swedish forest so that Dom can receive medical attention sooner. As is the way in horror movies, this one fatal mistake of taking a shortcut through the forest results in the entire group, minus Luke, being brutally murdered as sacrifices to the Norse god, Jotun. This slow burning indie horror really sends home the idea of not straying from the road you know is safest, as you may end up as Christmas tree decorations for a centuries old immortal Norse god. Number nine, Bo. A Quiet Place. A surprisingly delightful horror thriller and directorial debut of John Krasinski and Emily Blunt, this movie brings the audience face to face with a type of monster that hunts purely based off of sound. We meet parents Evelyn and Lee, as well as their three children, Reagan, Marcus and Bo, who all communicate using American Sign Language to avoid making any noise. After going to an abandoned superstore to stock up on supplies, the Abbott's three-year-old child Bo becomes intrigued by a space shuttle toy. His father Lee notices before it can make any sound and shortly after removes it from Bo's possession. Several moments later, we see Regan return the space shuttle toy to Bo, along with the batteries, presumably not knowing that it would make sound, considering she's deaf. Of course, this then prompts Bo to put the batteries back into the toy once the family have left the superstore attracting the attention of the monsters and unfortunately leaving him to become the next victim of these elusive creatures. Had Regan been told that the space shuttle toy actually made sound, obviously she wouldn't have given it to Bo and therefore his death could have been avoided. Number eight, Kaylee. Oculus. Not so much a horror as it is an unsung gem in the genre, this Karen Gillan movie provides a series of slow burning jump scares alongside a debatably good plot and unique storytelling perspective. Following the traumatic childhood of Kaylee and Tim, we learn that weeks after purchasing an old and unusual mirror for his new office, their father Alan and mother Marie begin to experience unsettling visions, which appear to play on pre-existing paranoia. Eventually it's revealed that yes, it is a haunted mirror, but surprisingly, no, they aren't going to tell us how or why. At this moment, all we need to know is that it has caused a series of brutal murders by possessing an occupant of its household. After murdering his wife, Marie, Alan is subsequently murdered by his 10 year old son, Tim, who was then incarcerated and released from a mental institution at the age of 18. Reuniting with his sister, Kaylee, who's managed to track down the Oculus mirror, they agree to destroy the mirror together. However, we soon find out that the mirror has other plans and plagues these siblings with the same visions that haunted their parents years earlier. This causes Tim to activate one of the traps designed specifically to kill the mirror, but instead kills his sister, Kaylee as once again, the mirror has cast an illusion that has played out in its favor. Had the siblings decided not to reap vengeance for their parents, both Kaylee and Tim could have continued to live long and happy lives. Number seven, Aaron, Creep. This fantastic found footage flick starring only Mark Duplass and Patrick Bryce aims to show the dangers of websites such as Craigslist and the weird yet slightly wonderful adverts that come along with them. We follow Aaron, a videographer, who sees an advert online requesting a videographer for a day-only job 
following a man named Joseph. As the day progresses, Aaron is hit with the realization that Joseph is truly a creep defined. We never truly know when the extent of Joseph's weirdness will cease, as every section of the movie attempts to ramp it up tenfold. The precipice of this movie though comes in the form of screaming, don't do it at your TV screen in the final leg of the movie. Despite being faced with undoubtedly the strangest individual he's ever met, Aaron decides to give Joseph the benefit of the doubt and meet him in a public place in the hopes to secure his safety. Before the credits roll, an axe is sent directly into Aaron's head by Joseph as we watch helplessly from Aaron's car. This final scene is so raw, it's almost laughable as we sit there wondering why Aaron didn't just do what any normal person would have done in this situation to avoid a stalker and just ring the police. Number six, Hugh. Images. Robert Altman's innovative 1972 psychological horror finds its way onto the list mainly because of its subject matter. The frequent exposure to only a handful of characters in this movie makes it feel extremely claustrophobic and you'd be forgiven for wanting to kill all of the characters the same way that Catherine does. Catherine is a schizophrenic woman who has not been diagnosed with the disorder before the time the opening credits roll, nor by the time the closing credits leave you wondering if your reflection really is your reflection. It's an unsettling depiction of schizophrenia and the hallucinations that accompany it, but is an accurate representation of what can happen when this disorder is not medicated. Our protagonist is plagued by evil versions of herself that she tries to kill at any opportunity. Only at the very end of the film do we discover that her final and successful attempt at killing her alter is actually her husband, Hugh. Had Catherine just been medicated when it was clear to those around her that she was very, very unwell, she could have gone on to live a normal life. Number five, Fionn and Jeremy, Apostle. A slightly more brutal entry onto this list, Apostle is a period folk horror that attempts to show the archaic nature of 19th century cults. The attitude towards women in this film is accurately representative of those of colonial style communities, as Fionn and Jeremy are two teenagers or young adults that are in a relationship clearly against their father's wishes. It's revealed to Fionn's father, Quinn, that she is pregnant. Quinn, being an archetypal misogynistic individual who views his control over his daughter as extending as far as her sexual life, murders her in a forced abortion. He afterward frames Jeremy for Theon's murder and he is then killed by the community in a purification ritual that Quinn is able to convince the others to give to him. As Fionn and Jeremy were both aware of the values of this community, surely they could have survived if they just left. Number four, the baby. Mother. For anyone who's seen this slow burning yet truly fantastic piece of cinema will know that it's the living definition of zero to 100 real quick. Obviously minus the allegorical aspect of this film, there was absolutely no need for the infanticide to take place in this movie. Javier Bardem's character, who's clearly a metaphor for God, progressively lets more and more people into his home as the movie progresses. We see the increasing distress of his wife and the strain which this very odd behaviour appears to be putting on their relationship. As tensions rise alongside the number of squatters in their house, so does the squatter's interest in mother's pregnancy and her impending labour. She is aware that as soon as she gives birth, the squatters are going to want to see their favourite author's baby and warns her husband against the potential dangers of giving them access to it. Of course, after the birth, the crowd tear the baby apart within minutes. It's a harrowing and unexpected turn that the audience really don't expect. And because infanticide is not at the forefront of many movies nowadays, probably because of the trauma inflicted by train spotting, we can't help but think, what if Javier Bardem just didn't give the crowd the baby? Number three, Eddie, It Chapter Two. Potentially the most heartbreaking entry onto this list, Eddie's death in It Chapter Two really did its job with pulling on the heartstrings of the audience that watched this film. Although not viewed by many as an out and out horror, it definitely deserves to be on this list, just purely because of the way it captures childhood nostalgia. Obviously it's not hard to understand the reason behind Eddie's death, 
other than to cause heartbreak for the audience, as it was to stay within keeping of the original novel's plot. Either way, his death could have easily been avoided within the universe itself. As Eddie is already injured by the time the Losers Club go down to the sewers to face Pennywise, the most sensible decision in this situation would have been to leave Eddie at the surface and to return back to him once they defeated the dancing clown. Number two, the family. The Hills Have Eyes. An admirable attempt at a reboot, this 2006 remake of Wes Craven's original film with the same title really scratches an itch if you're a fan of gory horror. This cannibalistic gem of a film follows the trip of Bob and Ethel Carter, who are heading to San Diego via the desert in order to celebrate their wedding anniversary. Their family and two dogs are packed into the car and trailer with them, making for an already secular and isolated movie opening. As you can probably imagine, heading into the desert where there is literally nobody else for miles around doesn't really strike much confidence into the heart of the majority of the population. <laughs> After stopping for gas and speaking to an elderly shop assistant, they are told about a shortcut through the desert. As we learned earlier with the ritual, shortcuts are more often than not a terrible idea. <laughs> After the puncturing of their tires, the family is slowly picked off one by one along with their dogs. And the culprits? Deformed cannibals that live in the hills. If that's not enough to get you bashing your head against a wall, then what is? Number one. Every single character, the Saw franchise. Those of you with a keen eye were probably wondering where Saw was going to end up on this list. And here is your answer. These movies put such a large emphasis on the will to survive that even just watching one of them makes you want to prove to yourself that you could survive one of Jigsaw's sick traps. For the sake of continuity, we are going to discount Detective Hoffman and Amanda from this list as they were purely in it for the kill. But Jigsaw's semi-understandable madness behind his philosophy does kind of mean that every single one of his victims could have survived. Jigsaw always provided a way out, and nine times out of 10, that was simply just listening to whatever he had to say and then following those instructions. If a mass serial killer was literally telling you what to do in order to survive, surely you would listen to them, right? So that's it folks, 10 horror movie deaths that could have been avoided. Now, if you can think of any others that absolutely should have been on this list that for some reason I have completely forgotten, you're more than welcome to mention them in the comments. As always, thanks for watching and be sure to come back soon for some ghoulish content.